All right, guys, so welcome to another episode of the Imperfectly Perfect podcast. Like every week, I chat to some of the most inspirational, inspiring guys and girls all around the world and just uncovering their stories and having those hard conversations. So today, like every other week, an amazing person that I got to know oh, probably around over 25 years ago when this guy came into my life through the screen is got a full on role shaping some of the world's most popular workouts, a young family and a passion for health and fitness. He's a world leader in fitness as a Les Mills program director, speaker and communication coach. He's a master's in IBC, NLP, TLT, a certified hypnosis coach, and he's taught on world stages and presented and inspired millions around the world. So welcome to the show, Dan. Thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure. I'm really happy to uh, just sit and chat and exchange some great stories and anything else that comes up. Well, it's great. And like I say, 25 years ago, this, this DVD got put in front of me in a, in a group fitness class. And I was like, what's this? And I was actually talking, I did an episode with Bevan and Rachel the other day, and we were saying how it was, you know, when we talk about faith, because you're a man of faith, and I want to talk about that a little bit later, but my journey has took me on this whole thing where it's brought me to faith and it actually opened up a pathway to realize how my journey had evolved and how from getting out of hospitality through college into fitness to coming in front of you guys thinking, how was I ever going to get to New Zealand? For my mom to suddenly meet a guy to move to New Zealand, for me to then move to New Zealand and I got the wrong bloody location. I was chasing you guys. I found Christchurch. <laughs> So I found Bevan and those guys and to move to Australia and later on get put in front of you guys and spend a weekend with you both um, to then photographing you guys. And it's man, where things go, where things go. It's 25 years ago. And one of the things I wanted to touch upon with you, first of all, was you said something in an interview once, which I pay attention a lot. And you said what people see on screen is this guy punching and kicking or a guy doing some wood chops. But that's really just one part of my life. And through my faith, I have learned how to anchor myself so I can best support my community, friends and colleagues. So I suppose, can you take us back to the beginning of your journey moving, I suppose, into fitness or, or, or that journey that led you into faith? Did you have the faith at the beginning of it or did it evolve over time? Sure. Growing up. I sort of struggled with the whole religion, faith, something else. What is it? Mm -hmm. What are other people's perspectives if I go down that road? What is my own internal dialogue if I stay in this journey? And so being brought up Judaism, liberal Judaism, uh, to, to ensure that my nana was happy and my mum was happy, mm -hmm. Uh, it was real confusing. You know, I grew up in quite a complex, confusing family that really fell apart. And very often I would hear um, Judaism be a thing that would bring us back together. Mm. And mm. I probably came in and out like most adolescents do. And as I went through my teenage years, my early 20s into you know, my 30s and now into my near mid 40s, uh, I rekindled a type of faith. And now where I sit, married to my wife, who has a strong Christian family currently actively in the church and my Jewish background that to me in itself is complex and confusing and it was I'd say about nine years ago now I was just hanging out in New York we had a job and it was in a Starbucks I saw a rabbi and um, I don't know if you know much about orthodox versus liberal Jews um, and you can sort of tell in terms of orthodox to what would be seen as sort of mainstream orthodox and it's the it's the long sideburns it's the chippah yeah. um and yeah. so very recognizable as a rabbi and uh he was wearing a star of david and he was wearing a cross and uh i thought that blew my mind i don't know if you know much about old testament versus new testament 
and really the thing that sort of separates was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so there's this point post resurrection of Jesus Christ where Judaism is taught that sort of, you know, me growing up, there was this like, Jesus isn't real, you know, he's not the only Messiah. And, um, and so I sort of hit him up and said, Hey, I don't mean to bother you, but um, I've got a little bit of confliction going on. And I see that you've got a star of David and you've got, you know, a crucifix, you've got a cross and you're wearing them and it's out. So I'm guessing you're wearing them with pride. And he said, and he explained to me in, in a short way that there was quite a movement that was going on around the world and certainly in New York. And it was called the Jewish Christian. And these were, these were, these were Jewish people that believed there was a resurrection of Jesus Christ or in the learnings of Christianity today, because they're, they're very, very similar yeah. in Judaism and Christianity. And that, that, um, that just sat well with me. I sort of felt like I could come back to my, my wife's side of her family and then my old upbringing that I'd sort of left behind me, but that was installed by my, my nana. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. and so sort of sitting back in this strange field of the Jewish Christian actually works for me. And so we actively go to church and the church that we go to is called life. It's a um, non-denomination church based here in, in Auckland, New Zealand. And I think the one thing I love about this particular church is almost like going and watching and being a part of an audience of a TEDx talk mm. every single Sunday, apart from a few Bible verses. They talk about neuroscience. They talk about motivation. They talk about awareness and all of these things that I study and talk about and love and, and, and enjoy being a part of just really sort of sits very well with me. And so my very old, very young in my early teens, immature sort of Bible basher, you can't talk to me about that stuff, yeah. is, is yeah. completely worlds apart. And now, you know, look, I've got three young daughters and um, we bring them up in, in that environment. And at the very least, it's an anchoring for them until when they're of an age where they really want to make their own decision. And so that that's the steps that I walk in and I and I'm really comfortable with that but thanks for asking I haven't really spoke about that much see I tell you I go into these delve delve into deep conversations because I love that because everybody knows you from these highlights of this incredible career but people don't know this side and I think that for itself I want to bring it back towards mental health like even though we're talking about faith and like you say, when people mention religion, sometimes you get this divide of people. But I think when you've walked through a journey of self-reflection and learned everything like I have on this journey and you have on yours, obviously, all the external stuff doesn't matter as much. Because like you said, you know now how to support your community and the people you're teaching a lot better than that younger self of yours. So I suppose, how has it shaped you? to know then because you moved into like NLP and hypnosis and all those kind of things. How's it equipped you, I suppose, through your journey in faith, through maybe going through adversity and learning these lessons to be that better leader that everyone knows you to be? Well, it gave me something to anchor from. And so I think in life, there has to be multiple things that anchor you down, whether it's spiritual guidance, whether it's financial, whether it's relationships, whether it's personal, whether it's career, whatever it may be, there has to be something that sort of holds you steadfast, be comfortable. You've got to be in part happy. And so to me, they're building blocks. And so the decisions that I make, the people I surround myself with, the people that I allow influence me and the people that I help influence, that comes from that very basic anchoring block. And so it was a natural process of me moving in a direction. Whoa, I really like this. What's making me feel more happier? What's taking me further away of, of how I was brought into this world? You know, and, and, and at the same time, what things do I want to rediscover? And so through this journey, you know, through fitness, through being able to uh, travel around the world many, many times to many, many different countries and having such a wide, diverse audience in multiple languages, languages with different histories, with different culture, different abilities, different needs. Having those different types of conversations just made me go, what else is there? that I could also be interested in. 
And it's a rude awakening when you're put in a position where your passport's been stolen, your bags haven't turned up, you've got no money, and yet you still need to deliver because people from all over that nation has they paid or they've they've traveled just to come and see you. And I remember this this one one particular time in my life that really stood out. And if you've got a little bit of time, I'll share it with you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, And that was it was a trip in uh, we're going to Brazil. And the the short version is Aquila Palau, he he had um Palo Aquil, he had managed to sell a license. And this, at this time, it was, a, it was a Les Mills body pump slash body combat license to a compound in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of Manaus, which is the Amazon rainforest. And so I fly into Belang, which is on the outside. And then we take like a, 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 like a two jet to Manaus and then a tuk-tuk to uh, to a, an opening a barge opening and there i am with with hakel um paolo's wife and two other guys and they only knew one one english word and the english word was delicious <laughs> delicious and and so and that amused me and so i i'm surrounded by lots of different people speaking very little english me speaking very little brazilian portuguese but yet we're all sort of coming together for this one thing. We get on this boat where you've got to, you know, like you see in the movies, you're going down the, you're now going, you know, down the Amazon, through the Amazon, down the river, through the rapids. And we stop at this sort of big compound. Mm. And it's like, honestly, it's in the middle of nowhere, but there's probably about 200 villages that live there. And they have a mobile hut on bricks open the door and there's a couple of posters of Mike McSweeney. There's one of Rachel Newsham. There's one of Dan Cohen. Wow. And I do this thing with this busted up radio and a, and a tape player and teach this class. When we finish, we drink this jungle juice, whatever that was. I wake up at 4am <laughs> and we've got to reverse. We've got to go back up the river. We've got to get that, you know, we've got to go through all these things just for me to get back home. And so the decisions that I've made and the people who I allow in and who I want to surround myself with similar to your journey, because there's those stepping stones took me to something like that. Now, the reason why I'm sharing this short story is because up until that point, I didn't know there was a word that I knew, but I did not know what it truly meant until I went and I did this, this journey. And this was back in, I'm going to throw it out there. I'm going to say 2005. I'd say it was about that 2004, 2005. Now that one word that I learned from this big journey going, going through Brazil was compassion and seeing children of all different ages with nothing, mm-hmm. with a stick splashing in puddles, just with big smiles on their face. It sort of, I think that was a real stepping stone for then how I view other people, but also how I view myself in the environment surrounded by lots of different cultures and different languages and big diversities. And so that was, that was a real influence for me. And I just think that allowed me to sort of take something in, open up. I was quite closed, Mm. open up. And, and as a result of just keep opening up and just keep letting things in good things, only let the good things in the things that serve me, the things that make me happy those such things that challenged me, but also challenged me, you know, for the right reasons. It's just sort of really allowed me to be in the position and the comfortability that I am. But have you found all those challenges along your way? I was talking about this the other day. It's like you actually realize that those failures and those challenges and frustrations are actually blessings. They're lessons and then they become blessings because you look back and say, without that challenge, it wouldn't have made me stronger to be equipped to how to deal with that and then that, and then that. So do you, do you agree with that sentiment that everything that you've been put through and challenged, it's made you who you are today and you wouldn't want to change it? Yeah, look, it's, it's, there, it's a very common question to ask, mm. you know, looking back and reflection and, and regrets. Um, there were so many lessons that I learned along the way. It was just that some of those experiences were hard and they were hurting. 
you know, they were real tough. And so I wouldn't want to go through that type of stuff again. If there was another way of doing it, but still coming out the other side with the lessons learned, sure. But, you know, I don't have a time machine. And so as a result of that, so that's the, that's my thinking around it. But as a result of that, and because there isn't a time machine, no, I, I couldn't. Yeah. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't change anything because I couldn't go back and change anything. However, I am totally now equipped with recognizing those certain signs around challenges and what lessons I actually want to learn or need to learn and also open myself up for challenges that who knows, who knows what I'm going to learn out of it. Yeah. yeah. Hardship, hardship, you know, that thing around, you know, pressure makes diamonds. You know, there's a lot of element that is very true in life and how we, how we discover ourselves. It, 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 it I, you know what, I was listening to this one the other day and you know, sometimes I think when you've been on some of these journeys and you hear things and people go, it's not about the destination, it's the process and that. I think when you ultimately are broken and you go through those hard times of hurtship and you, you wouldn't want to go back, but you go, sometimes I think some people, there's no judgment because they're on their own journey, but they can be empty words because they've heard them. Because when you've been on that, you're like, I now know that that process is about patience and growth and learning. And I want to take it to your career because when people see the highlight reels and they see the, the, the thousands and I'd say millions of lives you've impacted over the world with the fitness. But one thing that stuck out for me was there's so many people that admire and look up to you and would want to ultimately be a presenter. I know back in my day, I was like, oh, I want to do that. But they don't know what comes behind the scenes. And it was brought to me even the other day and I explained it and it was like, but are you ready? Are you ready with what comes for that level? So with me, it was like, if you suddenly had an investment of millions of dollars, are you sure you're ready, Glenn, to know what to do with that money to make it sustainable and then grow? So like with yours, these people that want to be in your position, are you ready to be? And now I want you to go into what it actually takes because... I've heard of Rachel before and I'm like, wow. So a program director of multiple programs plus a family plus, yeah. If I was to be real cutthroat with my answer, yeah. it would be perseverance through rejection. Yeah. And it's a hard pill to swallow because that's when your perseverance, that's when your character really get questioned internally as well as externally mm. our sensory acuity goes out the window so the things that we see the things that we hear the things that we feel and to an extent the things that we smell and taste and then that sixth sense audio digital so the conversations that we have in our mind i mean how many here's a great question for you right now sidetrack how many conversations have you had in your mind in the last four days whether they were conversations of okay i'm going to speak to this person this is how i want it to go or you've had a conversation with someone or you've been in a scenario and you've gone oh why didn't that how why didn't i say that and oh i should have been more quick-witted yeah, yeah. analyzing yeah oh, a number of them i mean how many yeah. thoughts are we have in a day in those conversations yeah a lot sure and so all of that gets tested mm. Every single time when you have to perse persevere through a rejection. And so some anchor themselves to their why, some anchor to themselves to what they want their outcome to be. For me, it, it's based on values. What's my value system? And with in no particular order, but things that really jump out for me, legacy, I'm legacy driven. One that became more apparent to me last year it was sort of early last year maybe it was linked to COVID or not or certainly around some of my trainings was around a level of success and where people around me they were gauging their level of success by things or outcomes you know whether it was property whether it was cars whether it was a, a status whether it was circle of friends whatever it might be or followers on their social platforms for me, it occurred to me that I had put so much time and effort into really ensuring everybody, every touch point that I had was the very best touch point for them that mm. subliminally there was this thing that my measure of success 
was was judged by not. And what I mean by that was you could say the word failure. And so I so I measure by non-failure. Mm. Whereas other people, they look at that as that sort of like that's that side of the spectrum. And so they go, okay, yeah, I do this, I'm gonna get the house, I get the car, you know, I'm gonna have to want to be. So if I if I have, you know, I have to work hard in order to want the good things in my life. And then ultimately I'll be happy. Whereas for me over here, it's just like, if I can live in B, be happy with the things that I'm doing, ensuring that I don't fail, mm. then ultimately that's going to put me in the right direction. And that, that, that I think came about by this drip feed process that I've gone through around perseverance for rejection because re nobody likes rejection rejection sucks mm -hmm. rejection is is hard and it's very real and it's very raw and it can be surface level it can be really deep rooted level and so I, at the time i didn't know that i was persevering through rejection i just was like there was this there was this innate thing inside me that just said anybody anybody that would say you can't do that or you're not going to succeed or nah that's not good enough or nah you got to start again in the back of my mind I always had this thing like, oh, yeah, you, you just wait. You just wait because I'm going to show you. Yes. You just wait because it's, it's going to blow your mind. I'm going to make, I'm going to make you laugh. Right? I'm going to do these things that are just going to, you know, they're going to make so many people go, yeah, you just wait. I've got, I know somewhere if you give me some, I'll figure that out. And there was this, thing, you know, there was always this thing, but I never vocalized. It. I never, I never got to that point. I would just, you know, show i would be a robot and just you know showing poker face mm. and so and and what was going on in the background was that i was actually just i was training myself to outlive rejection you know to to you know to to have sort of a, a bit of a coat of armor mm. um i don't really teach people to do that because people need time to reflect and and come to come to the decisions that they make because it was the right decision for them and in this world with the technology that we have which we didn't really have growing up and the in covid is a great example and finance mm. those mm. things that are going on right now they need for us to operate slightly differently like you and i we could not operate how we were operating 25 years ago it just it just wouldn't work yeah we could yeah. take some of the elements that we've learned and some of the experiences we've been through and some of those like you just wait because i'm going to show you i'm going to make you smile like we can take some of that and, and 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 still feed that through in some of the decisions and how we show up but ultimately we we have to learn and <laughs> we've got to take our blinkers off and so yes you know those experiences they can only be described as blessings. They really only can be. Yeah, it's so fascinating. I see you when you said, Do you, have you got time to go into this? I love going deep into these because there was uh, there was one thing I was I was mentioning before, like I, I got to speak to Dr. Joe Dispenser and he was talking about fundamentals and characteristics. And a lot of the things that you even say there, I pick up on certain words, whether it's something that I get and four, four characteristics that he was talking about in a lot of things in the commonality between people that when you suddenly get to this place on your journey, it's almost a sense of truth. You look internal and you found your truth and you utilize that voice that you were talking about before. There's your ultimate surrendering to get rid of that voice or those voices that we're listening to. Um, what was the other one? Obviously learning that we're not in control. So you've got, you're not control, you're surrendering. And then the other thing, and I notice this sometimes when you speak, and obviously when you're on stage and that as well, it's when your passion and everything comes together, it's almost like that childlike nature. You're so passionate and that's how everything comes together and comes to fruition. And every single person, and I'll draw it back because you mentioned it at the beginning when we were talking about faith, is everyone who's got that commonality together has this spiritual journey and realizes that actually all the external stuff really doesn't matter. We actually have to align what's head and heart to make all that vocalized and to come out. But how have you, along your journey, I suppose, because it is a lot of work with what you're doing. You are in front of people. You're giving your energy. So essentially you're pouring out your bucket so much and the idea is to fill it so you can pour out. How have you not or have you endured burnout at times? 
Absolutely. Yeah, I've had burnout lots. I've been overwhelmed and burnt out. And I have fought internally and externally with myself. And I keep using those two phrases because it's really hard to hide your micro expressions mm. when you're frustrated, when you're tired, uh, when, you're, when, you're, when you're physically in pain. You know, like I've gone through chronic back, back pain, come out the other side. Thank goodness for Les Mills Core. Quick plug there. Um, <laughs> that's going to keep me in the industry forever. And um, and so it, I guess the question is like, so then, then what do you do? One, and I didn't do this at the beginning. So I never admitted it. I never admitted that I was tired. I never admit, admitted that I was fatigued. My ego got in the way of all that type of stuff as a younger man. And so now... I understand when I'm getting fatigued. I understand when I'm getting tired. And, and that has magnified quite quickly as I'm a daddy of three. Very recently, we, you know, we had three under three, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and my daughter, one of my daughters going through some health issues, which I can expand on if need be. And so, you know, there's things going on at home. There's things going on at work. There's other things going on in my life around the, the coaching work that I do and when I notice that I'm overwhelmed I, I recognize those autopilots or what I call those triggers really quickly now mm -hmm. and so the words that I use the, the micro expressions I notice you know because I do a lot of work sort of online and so there's like I see I see my audience my audience is seeing me I'm seeing me whilst I'm seeing my audience and it's, and it, to me, if you know what it is that you're looking for, certain eye patterns, breathing patterns, certain energies, to me, it's quite obvious that I, I have these certain things that just trigger up for me that's like, Dan, maybe don't train so hard today. Dan, maybe have an early night. Mm -hmm. Dan, maybe you just need to go and have some more cuddles right now. Dan rather than filling everybody else's buckets, because it's really easy to fall into this trap. And, and I'll say this, is that there are these three buckets. And if I, if I had like a pen, I would, I would draw three buckets, right? And so the, the top bucket is what we call the I bucket. The, bot, the middle bucket is what we call the we, we bucket. And the bottom bucket is the they or them. And in order for the we, and so in my life, that would be me, and my wife, and my children, and my closest, closest friends. The they bucket is more based around work colleagues, mm -hmm. um, other people that I meet, but, but regularly. So therefore, that I bucket really needs to be filled up. And in order for these other two buckets to really just be like, yeah, on it, I bucket has to be uh, amazing. And... What that might mean is people do lots of different things. They find new hobbies. They do creative design or design thinking, adaptive thinking. They do courses or training, something that, that fills up that I cup. For me, um, I like to play the ukulele. I like to go fishing. I like to go camping. And I actually like to do these just individually or with some mm. other friends and that feeds me and when I sort of have that Dan time my wife and my children they only ever get the very best of Dan time and it wasn't really up until recently I'd say it was about three years ago there was really no I cup it was all it was all we cup they cup them cup it was it was and I thought that by making everybody else happy by doing stuff with everybody else mm. and and sort of being like the glue of bringing people together um, I thought I was doing that because that's what made me happy. It does, but there was these other things that. So my eye, my eye cup was really, it was empty. There's there's a hole. There's all these holes in the bottom, and you've got to you've got to put the you know you've got to put the cork yeah. in the the bottom, right? And so I'll say to yourself and all to your listeners, like honestly, don't be afraid. It, it's you're it's not selfish if you want to do something by yourself, by your you know on your own. That just really makes you feel really great. Whether it's fifteen minutes, a three-day camping trip, a week on holiday, and it doesn't matter what it is. But ultimately, if you don't do those things, burnout, overwhelming—that that just happens really, really quickly. 
Oh, you're just speaking my words. It's like my bucket was empty and it had gravel in the bottom. <laughs> I was told that. It was like, Glenn, you just, you're giving. And you said it there. Like, I think I always say this on this podcast because everyone you meet has words that something resonates with you when you learn from everyone. You said it right there. You was like, you thought that made you happy. The same with me. I was pouring in every direction, giving to everybody and then trying my family on top. But something's got to give. And namely, it's you. Like, and that's where your boundaries come in, obviously. But then I used to find that hard. And, and it's all growth. But you're touching up and there. Then your family get the best of you. And I know you've just recently spoken about your daughter's health. Um, how has that been for, for you as a father to, to see your daughter going through her health issues? And obviously, you're trying to do all this job and this career be there and everywhere. And how's that been? Well, firstly, I was devastated. You know, my, my wife and I, you know, with any parent, um, when you find out your child, you know, has some type of health issue. And for hers, hers is a rare eye disease called panuivitis. And to my understanding, and I'm only really just learning because this we're only sort of six weeks in. And as you can hear, all three children have decided to come into <laughs> this room. My three little bear cubs. And um, there's... Uh, four types of uveitis, UV, uveitis. You've got the back of the eye, the front of the eye, the, the center of the eye, and then panuveitis, which is all of the eye, which means it, it usually has some type of underlying health issue. And so, you know, she was tested for um, lots of different things, tuberculosis, arthritis, cancer, tumor, you know, and, and so there's that unknown period of time so that's the devastating part you know that's the you know the, again that's the lots of praying that's having faith you know all of that comes it's being tested so that's they're, they're they're the types of challenges they're the challenges that you don't want but yeah. yet they hit you they come out of nowhere and when you come out the other side of them our learning really grew about how do we then deal with zara and what are the side effects and so initially that was very hard um, but she has the treatment. We've got a plan. And so that's where, where that's, we're in that phase. It's a journey. It's not like a, you know, a, a course of antibiotics and she'll be right. It'll be, it'll be a minimum of two years. It's weekly visits, so on and so forth. And so, you know, that has a real effect on, you know, ones if we wanted to go away for a two week holiday or what does that then look like? And do we have enough medication and do we have to move for appointments? And so, um, yeah, so that's, that's sort of on that side. But I will say something that really did help and it helped really early on. I, which I wouldn't normally do. See, I, I, it, this is crazy. I coach people in asking for help. And yet it's one of the hardest things for me personally still <laughs> to do. Yeah. And so when I do do it, I do it because it's, it's something that I actually do need help and support or I need support on, not necessarily help me through the hard time, but I need, I need some other type of help and or support. And so when we found out about Zara, my, our eldest, she's only four and a half years old. One of the first things I did after my wife and I, we spoke about it and we got our heads around it is I actually went to, I went to my company. I went to Les Mills International and I, and I, and I, asked for some support and that would you know, what does that then look like and that would be so there might be times where i'd love to naturally be able to do that that particular meeting but it might coincide with medication and or treatment or appointments because each appointment isn't like a 30 minute to you the doctors these are five six hours at the specialist every single time we've done we've been like that every single time it's between three to six hours but most of the time it's been five or six hours it's, it's a lengthy process mm -hmm. and you know, so asking for support around flexibility around that. Um, and what they've come back with is a whole full on amount of support and lots of check ins, which has just been really nice. And mm -hmm. so for anybody out there listening, if you if anything's going through your life and you're worried that your employer might look down on you or might think that oh, you then can't do the job right. I would ask you to, to think again, you know, when you have a when you have a real authentic conversation with your employer, you tell them what's going on for you, what you're feeling and or what support, you know, you may need or may not need. You may, you may, it may just be something other than nothing other than, Hey, something's going on for me in my world right now. Bear with me. It might take me a little bit of time. 
but I will make sure that I hit all of my deadlines. But I just need to bring you up to speed because if I don't and something comes up, you may see that you may downgrade that that's me not being able to do my job or or actually you know not deserving a promotion that i've spent you know x amount of years working towards or whatever it might be so be real have the conversation don't be afraid to have those conversations no one's no one's gonna chop your legs away if you're sharing your heart and you're being real in my experience and in the experience of the people that i coach yeah and how is your daughter doing because i know kids are resilient like how is she doing rather than you guys well, you wouldn't know, like, you know, if she doesn't have the medication, she doesn't have the treatment, she'll lose vision in both eyes, it's split to both eyes. Right. And so right right now, it's it's holding. And so that says to me, the medication is working. Mm -hmm. But it, so after you ha after she has the, the course of steroids initially, um, she's put on other medication. And so what happens is, is you reduce the amount of steroids, you up, increase the other medication, and which is sort of, less intense you know steroids for anybody is is hard because you have a compromised immune system yeah. and she's now she'll be left with a compromised immune system whilst on medication so um apart from us being super cautious around who she interacts with which is almost next to impossible she's about to go to big girl school you know when they're five here in new zealand you know and so she's at preschool right now and they they all of them we're in level four lockdown right now and all of them are sick not with COVID, but they're all sick. They've all got sniffles and, and, and whatever, right? And so those types of things, it just takes longer for her. But apart from that, you know, she's she's happy. Yeah, you, yeah, you wouldn't know. You're right. Kids are resilient. Yeah. And um, we didn't get much kickback from her taking medication because it's not a nice process. Things like steroid eye drops, injections and or blood tests, you know, they're still challenging. But we have a great team that we're linked to at Starship here in Auckland. Very big shout out to Starship. There's there's just such beautiful people. They're all about your children. They're all about because Starship is dedicated specifically to children. And so they're all about Zara. It's nothing about the parents, all about Zara. And then when Zara's going through her thing, then they come to the parents and they say, Hey, what support and help do you need? Which no one ever asks, you yeah. know. And so so I, I do feel like we're fully supported and look. You know, maybe I'm just getting a little bit more sensitive as I get older. I, I don't know. But, you know, I love cuddles and I'll come into, I've completely failed as a disciplinary parent. I come in in the middle of the night, I take her out of her bed and I bring her into our huge, big custom made bed that we have. And we all co-sleep because I think there's nothing better than waking up with my babies in the morning. Because I know there's going to be a point in their lives where they don't want to have a cuddle with mommy and daddy. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful, man. Seriously. And when it comes to COVID, obviously you're in stage four lockdown again, same as us. We're going into week 10 again. Um, we get through it, but I suppose this is a wake up call for anyone that's never experienced mental health. I think it's a wake up and say, hey, guys, welcome to experience what it's like for everyone else. So I think everyone's got a little bit more of an understanding. How have you coped during this time? And is there any advice, especially in the health and fitness, where predominantly it does get us through a lot and you've got a lot of people who listen to you in terms of that realm? How have you managed to cope with, with your time aside from everything that you've been going through with, with your daughter and just COVID in general? Yeah, look, you know, mental unrest, mental health can affect anyone of any gender at any age at any time. And so, you know, but you're Mr. Motivator or you're, you look at your physique or, or you're a nutritionist or whatever it might be. It, it can, it can happen to us all because things happen. You know, we have family members that might pass away. And so we have to deal with grief or, you know, we get sick ourselves, you know, or we, or we have an injury and, and therefore it stops us from doing certain things. And all of that plays with one's mind. We question ourselves in different ways. And so if anybody is going through mental unrest, um, asking hard, challenging questions of themselves or even questioning whether it's, oh, that can't happen to me. Don't be hard on yourself because it can happen to everybody. It can happen to everybody multiple times in lots of different ways at any particular time. There are scientific things that you can do with your body that can put you in a good head space, guaranteed. Physical exercise scientifically proven 
can do that. And so the days where you are feeling unmotivated, the days where you're just feeling down about yourself, the days you're feeling where you're just questioning whether you're even making the right decisions, you'd find that going through a nice long walk, short type of exercise, doing one of our Les Mills at home workouts, or if you are not in a lockdown and you can go to a gym, doing a group fit class or any type of workout, already the chemical balance changes that happen inside the brain will just put you on a trajectory of maybe maybe I've over overlooked things or maybe I've I've been a bit too hard on things or maybe that I you know you, you can come out the other side eat cleaner mm. if you can even if you can reduce sugar if you can reduce alcohol if you can reduce confection if you can reduce that type of stuff or take it out scientifically proven again the chemical changes inside the body I won't go into too much detail it will just put you in a better head space you'll become more clear. You'll be able to make more decisions from decision make. I say this decision making is, is a really powerful thing. The best decisions that you make are the ones that you make because you have found the answers yourself. And I, the, only way, the only way I can really liken to it is have you, Glenn, have you ever, have you ever found an, an artist, a DJ, an artist, whoever it may be, that you've come across and you've gone, their music is awesome. Not because you saw it on Instagram or Facebook or somebody said, hey, have you ever heard of DJ? You mm. just were scrolling. You went down the rabbit hole of Spotify playlist, whatever you did, and you came along, you were like, <gasps> and all of a sudden they just made it in your top sort of three artists of all time. Yeah. 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 So well, when that happens for you, because you, that, that, that organically happened for you, that's the same with decision-making. Mm. And so yeah. it's like, I could tell you different types of exercises that you could do that would make you feel great. But until you experience and you do it yourself and you, and you figure that out for yourself, I can give you examples like go for a walk, do some swimming, you know, do mo train with somebody else because training with somebody else is really motivating, but not everybody likes to do things with it. Listen to her music, eat some great food, do all these different types of things and you will fall onto something that you're really, really like. You know, Tony Robbins wrote a book and it's called Awaken the Giant Within. And what he often says is that he says, try 10 things, try 10 things. And you've got to try these 10 different things a minimum of 10 times. And out of those 10 things that you try 10 times, out of these 100 experiences, you'll have two experiences. You will think to yourself, I quite enjoyed that, or I quite like that, or I'm actually pretty good at that, or I'd like to learn more about that. And so trying new things is really important. I know lots of presenters, facilitators, and trainers and coaches, they use the term, get out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. when, when we talk about the topic of mental health, depression, mental unrest, I don't use that term, get out of your comfort zone. I, I just stay with let's stretch comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say that is that you got you, if you stretch somebody's boundaries, if you get them to a point where it's like, you know what, my palms are a little bit sweaty, my heart's starting to race a little bit, but I'm okay. I'm safe. I'm okay. I can do this. You know, and I use that as a metaphor of lots of different things that they, you know, one could experience. Mm -hmm. Then when asking, would you do that again? There is a higher percentage of, of those that would say yes versus no versus, okay, you've never done this experience before. Let's get completely out of your comfort zone and just try it. Come on, just dive in, just yeah. dive in and they have a bad experience, the chance that they're going to want to do it again diminishes significantly. Yeah. And so for anybody listening, if it's like, you know, I have thought about doing that, that's an, that's an indication of stretching. Give it a go. Give it a go. If it's like, I would never do that, that's usually an indication of it's outside of. But if you do, though, if you do more of those, like, I've thought about, oh, I don't know, I'm a little bit, meh. the more that you do those types of things that stretch you, that actually takes you a little bit closer to, okay, so now that you've done those things that you didn't think you would normally do, but you were, you were thinking about them and you do them multiple times. Now, if you say, okay, so would you jump out of a plane, which would be one of those things I never, ever, ever do. It's mm -hmm. like, actually, maybe I would, like, as long as I was safe and, you know, 
you know, and, and would you ride a horse or would you ride a book? Would you do public speaking? All those things oh, I wouldn't do. Maybe you, they would try it because you've given them, you know, you've, you've allowed them more taste. They've tasted it. And working out, you know, lots of different types of workouts, different types of meal prep that you can do, different books that you can read. It all takes you a step closer away from depression and mental health and unrest, mental unrest, and into a place of the decisions that I have organically made right for me. And therefore I can, to an extent, control some of the decisions or the outcomes of them because I'm making them specifically for myself in these mini steps right now. Wow. I think that just goes to show you, even when you were talking about when people say, get out of your comfort zone, I think ultimately when it comes to your profession, a lot of people following in your footsteps and inspired by you and they think, right, I need to get my cues down pat. I need to get that physicality down pat execution. That's one part of it. But I suppose the human potential and the development in people and how to understand how people in your class that you're in front of, how you can touch is exactly what you were drilling down on there. Like nail all that together and you can bring it together, I suppose. And it, it, it just come down to that. How can you get your people or the best out of your people if they are struggling? Yeah. Compassion, empathy. <clears throat> you got a screen. So in, in, in a, in the context of a class, the four quadrants, because I know that you have instructors that, that um, tune in to your mm. podcast, is it is looking out, looking out to your four quadrants, you know, to the left side, to the right side, to the front side, to the back side, checking in, connecting, lots of praise and encouragement for years with inside the Les Mills family is that we really drove around technique and coaching and role modeling and you know i must never miss a rep and then things change and we became really personable and i just love how connection and performance mm -hmm. plays a really 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 important role so much so that they're, they're sort of the main two now key elements that you'll learn during initial training that you, that you do your module training with the company and connection Connection is so important. Validation, praise and encouragement is so important. And being able to, and it is a skill, and I'd actually call it a perishable skill. So I, if you don't use it, you lose it. Being able to look out at your audience, identify what are the needs. Okay, so that one, that one needs motivation because you can see they're trying to go for it, but their energy is going low. And so that's, that's motivation because there's like a confidence versus competent thing going on. And so they have the confidence um, so they've got the confidence, but the confidence being, being diminished because they're fatiguing. So they need a little booster or pick me up. This person over here has got all the energy, but it's like the arms and legs are going everywhere, depending on what they're doing. And so it's like they've got all the confidence, but now it's the confidence. And so let's give them some, some tips and tricks to sort of align their movements so they can get, you know, better mm -hmm. energy expenditure and get better technique going on. These people over here, you know, your front rowers, they don't need a lot of attention but they do need check-ins and validation. And then those back rowers, that's where we don't just look out, but we sort of hold eyes, yeah. you know, and yeah. we hold that gaze and we might say a few sentences. And for me personally, and certainly for Rach and I, actually, when we do this, when we team teach, is that between us, we tag team and we revisit. So we don't just say it once. And so I might say, hey, Glenn, good to have you here, buddy. And then we'll be sort of round, round about track three. Come on, Glenn, this is all on you. I know it's all on you. You get to sort of track seven, track eight. Look at Glenn go, you know? And so just the revisiting, it is a skill, you know, and we're, do we're doing it because it's needed. It's genuine, genuine, but we're also doing it because we know that it works as well. And so you could do that in life. Think about picking up the phone to a family member that you haven't really spoken to for a wee while or a, or a Facebook message or a text. Think about um, how you can praise a colleague at work you know, and in fear of them not getting the promotion in front of you, but because they've just done a really good thing for their work. You know, lots of praise and encouragement. I, if I could, that would be my biggest sort of thing that I could share. It's like, come on, let's validate more people. You know, yes, yes, competition is healthy. And yes, there's going to be challenges, but really not, not if it's about ego driven. Yeah. Like, Let's praise people. Like, what's the big, what's the worst that can happen? So somebody looks at you 
and goes, oh, thank you. <laughs> you know? Yeah, true, true. And I suppose that, that, that leads me to my last question in everything that you've gone through, your journey up till day, you've got a lot longer to go, mate, but everything that you've learned, I've spoken to a lot of people where they've said, look, having fame doesn't make you happy. Having money doesn't make you happy. You see the highlight reels. What for you does being imperfectly perfect mean and where do you ultimately find that happiness that you've found? So far, because I'm going to say you've got a long time to go, mate. <laughs> As I've got older and I understand wisdom and I understand how to, how to interject and not interject, when to speak, when not to speak, when to show patience, imperfectly perfect is utilizing the skills that I've learned over the years in the right way because I know ultimately it's going to project somebody's future growth in the direction that is good and beneficial for them as a result I know that was because that came from a place of my skill set therefore it's going to be beneficial for me wow I haven't heard that version. Very good. Very good. Well, I just want to say, mate, on behalf of the campaign, on behalf of me, thank you for everything you do. This has been a totally different conversation, going deep and not talking about fitness and stuff and touch upon it. So, yeah, where can people find out more information about you? And not just the Les Mills stuff, because I know you do a lot of speaking on, on stages, NLP and hypnosis stuff. Where can people find that out? Social media platforms is really the fastest way. And so you can go to the official Dan Cohen. Um, that's, that's really the one that I, <laughs> I, I, I check the most. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and, and uh, certainly through Les Mills as well. We, you know, when we can do events for you, we'd love to do events for you. When we can do online masterclasses, you know, we have that technology already set up. Certainly when we come out of level four lockdown. And so we hope that we're not going to be in it for long. But I want to do a shout out for you because I have seen your journey as well. And I've seen over two decades where you've come from and where you are now and, and how you can conduct yourself and the things that you want externally because not all the people know but the perfectly perfect imperfect campaign you know this is a voluntary thing you know this is a this is this is something that you have dedicated a lot of time you continue to do so because you want to get that message out there and we want to spread that message and um i champion that and i and i'm very very grateful that you've allowed me to be a part of this and i hope that even just some of the words that i've used can resonate with other people like it has with you so thank you glenn awesome buddy appreciate that mate no it's it's it, it's been a journey and i wouldn't be the person that i was today and like i started that conversation with the faith because i wasn't and now i am and i've just learned along the way and Every single person I speak to, you learn something. And that's what I want to take. You said it a little bit earlier about different things work for different people. When I was struggling in the fitness industry with body dysmorphia, I saw a psychologist. It didn't work for me. And I thought that was it. What do I do? So I wanted to utilize listening to people like yourself and other people of that series of hope. If that doesn't work, this might work. So that kind of analogy of what Tony Robbins said, try 10 different things. Listen to 10 different episodes and you might hear Dan say something that, wow, I'll try that or I'll try that. And it's just that extra day that keeps you going. So, yeah, I appreciate that, mate. And I, as I say, thank you for everything you do. And guys, I'm going to put all the links up to Dan where you can find him. But until next time, guys, remember to keep having those hard conversations and make sure they go deep because those hard conversations keep saving lives. Until next time, guys. Thank you. Let me press stop and record.